podcast, I presume, about the uh, uh, species. Um, and I'll let you answer that as you get into it, Badger. Um, Great. Yeah, don't be shy, folks. Um, you know, this this can be as tailored to your interests to the best of my ability, to the best of our abilities uh, as we want it to be, or just an overview. Um, uh, but I always like to make sure that I'm actually answering people's questions. Uh, don't see any other... I'm going to roll up the window here. Oh, maybe not. Okay. Well, you had your chance. Let's go ahead and get started. Um, uh, so that was the introduction of me. Uh, let's jump into the um, this plan uh, as a as an example of how you might approach doing uh, silver pasture here. So this is a plan that I wrote for. Uh, Buckskin Valley Farm, which is a member of the Organic Valley Cooperative, which you may have seen at the the uh, grocery store. Um, uh, somebody's saying chat is disabled, so maybe Lindsay can turn that on. Um, but yeah, that their uh, their goals for a silva pasture. Uh, they became curious. To, the people who run Buckskin Valley Farm are very, uh, not, I wouldn't say experimental, but they're always eager to try new practices. Um, if it can help their bottom line and it can help, uh, you know, their milk production, animal health, uh, reduce their inputs. So um, those were some of the goals that we went in there. But um Basically, I'm going to scroll down past some of the legal jargon. Uh, Buckskin Valley Farm notices that they have a slump in forage production and milk production during the summer. Um, and that is something that they thought hmm, maybe having some uh, shade trees could help with that. That was their initial interest, right? And so uh, they contacted me through, I don't know, whatever back channels. Um, and as we got into the conversation about what their needs were, they also said, well, yeah, they um, they grow all their own feed, like on farm. It's a very interested, interesting, like they don't buy any feed. They just cut hay and grow corn and other crops and make silage. Um, and so increasing their uh, on on farm forage production uh, was interesting to them. They also didn't want to have, you know, they're going to invest a significant amount of time and effort and money into doing this, even if they, you know, get uh, paid back by a grant, which I think they will for planting the trees. And so it's not just shade. It's how fast can we get some shade? And then uh, can we get any additional uh, forage out of this? Uh, and the answer is yes, we can bring on the shade pretty quickly and we can also get additional forage. So um, uh, Karim and I, who's another agroforester, he's now um, pursuing his PhD at Yale. We went out and interviewed them. Uh, we walked the site pretty extensively. We took a bunch of soil samples um, and, you know, dived deep because there's never just one reason why somebody wants to do this kind of thing. And uh, what we came up with was they want to enhance the quality of life for their animals uh, in the so-called dog days of summer when things are really hot. And there's a fair amount of heat stress on the animals. Um, they notice that their uh, milk production drops significantly. And uh, looking at a little bit of historic climate data, uh, that drop is not uniform. And it seems pretty much dependent on the heat stress that the animals are facing, depending on the year. Um, 
John Fike, who's kind of the Silva Pasture leader in uh, Central Appalachia and like the uh, extension community and research community, he's he tries to make this push in general, not just with Silva Pasture, to be having livestock grazing on forage uh, that you didn't have to harvest and bale um, 300 days a year. So not 360 days a year, but 10 months out of the year. Um, we also noted that sometimes their animals get pink eye. That's not, you know, a slur or a diss, but it's just something that happens. And looking into it, it seems that, you know, how do you reduce uh, animals getting pink eye? They get shade uh, and they have less pink eye. Um, the fields, uh, parts of the fields that we're looking at uh, transition are wet. And so they wondered, could we design a silver pasture that helps transpire more moisture out of the ground? Um, and there's also a question of, could we provide habitat for birds that will eat the flies? Um, of course, like the, the swallows and everything that eat flies uh, are not ground nesting birds in a pasture. They normally live in tree cavities. So, and they were also talking about the need for more fence posts. So these are things that we're trying to meet all these needs in the Silva pasture plan. Um, it's about 24 acres. Uh, it is a circum neutral pH. So pH around seven, a lot of the time, uh, a silt loam, pretty nice soil. And uh, I'm gonna switch and uh, Joey, you can tell me if you don't see this switch, but uh, let's see here, the appendices. Looks good. Good. So here's some soil tests. Uh, basically three eight acre paddocks. Uh, looking at the soil is really important because sometimes some of these things are not just going to be solved by more uh, shade, but they you might need to put some soil amendments down, right? Uh, soil organic matters, okay, uh, not amazing, but, uh, you know, I'd like to see it up at three, but as long as you're hitting two, the soil's, you know, biologically alive or whatever. Um, notice that the phosphorus is pretty low. It'd be nice to have it up at 65 pounds an acre, and it's down uh, near 30. Um, fair amount of calcium, and, you know, we'd like to see at least 2,000 pounds an acre. The magnesium's fine. Uh, the potassium's okay. And, you know, so those are things to note. I'd like to see them put some fer organic fertilizer in their certified organic operation. So that everything has to be OMRI approved. Um, but, you know, I hired an agronomist to look at these soil samples. Um, they had very specific. Uh, recommendations um, to bring those those macronutrients at least up to a sufficiency level. I uh, noticed they didn't put any high calcium lime or dolomite lime because the parent material of the soil there is um, uh, already limestone that's rich in magnesium. So, um, yeah, uh, and I always recommend. I, whenever I go to a, new, a farm, I say, we're going to take some soil samples. Also, will you share your historic soil samples? And um, you can see that the uh, potassium in pounds per acre here is 218. And today, you know, 10 years later or something, the potassium pounds per acre is, you know, under 150 in most cases. So they've lost, you know, I don't know, 50 plus pounds of potassium per acre. Uh, and they hadn't they didn't realize that. So not everything's about the the uh the shade and the trees. Um, so that's always interesting. Anyway, let's go back to the silver pasture plan. Um and you know they they feed a fair amount of minerals and kelp and other things and they're still you know extracting 
more nutrients from the soil than they're putting back in. So I, I like to start by saying this is a reciprocal relationship we have with the soil. We have to feed the soil if we want to feed the livestock. It's probably enough about that. But if you don't, if you haven't tested the soil in your pasture, I uh, would suggest doing that. You can send it to Logan Labs like I did. You can send it to Spectrum Analytics. That's another good lab. Uh, you can work with your uh, extension agent to get a discount on these things, but it's not expensive. Um, they already did a pretty good job of uh, prescribed grazing, um, meaning that they subdivide their pastures uh, and have a lot of animals on them for you know a short period of time and then give it like a month or a little more of rest. Does is everybody feel pretty familiar with like management intensive grazing as as is being practiced here? Maybe you could put in the Q&A or the chat if you want me to talk more about that, because that's that's a whole side topic. I'll just wait seven seconds or something to see if any questions pop up. Yeah, I mean, I think it would be helpful if you could give a brief synopsis without. Okay. Sure. Using, yeah. So, so the forage is um, is present above and below ground. You got the root system, and you got the above ground thing that the animals eat. And uh, it's plants are funny, right? The leaves are basically solar panels, and they build the structure of the um, the plant using the energy from those solar panels. And so it's easy to overgraze uh, palatable forage species and undergraze uh, less palatable forage species. And so the idea is, is that by packing the animals in pretty tight and then moving them pretty quickly, they evenly, uh, more or less, eat all the different types of forage in the pasture uh, down to a level uh, where if you're skillfully managing the forage, they're not eating too much uh, and you're not like over time favoring less desirable species dominating the pasture. This is where you see people who don't rotate their animals at all have all kinds of weird pasture weeds that the animals don't like to eat. Um, uh, these, fo these folks go in after they move the animals and they'll, they'll say they're clipping they run the brush hog really high and just cut off the tops of any weeds that are about to get a seed um you know they might raise it up to six or eight inches off the ground but just anything that the the management intensive grazing didn't solve in, in that regard um is discouraged from taking over. And this is actually very good because it increases the amount of forage that is available from your limited number of acres for the animals. Of course, it takes more work. You know, if you have a full-time job and only come and mess with your animals on the weekend, uh, which is never completely true, right? Because everybody's going to check on their animals after work, but it, you know, it probably takes two hours a day to rotate your animals at least. And that's just extra work. So I'm going to just give a plug for management intensive grazing. There's lots of different terminology, but you get the point. It's a it's a hands-on part-time job every day. Um, uh, in general, we go there and we see that it's uh, it's like endophyte-free fescue, tall fescue, uh, which is a great cool season forage. It's very prevalent, and they had removed. Uh, I don't. I think through tillage. Um, they'd removed the tall fescue that has the toxic endophyte in it. Is everyone familiar with, um, uh, fescue toxicosis? That's something I could touch on. Probably could. Um, we're in a part of the country that extends from like Southern Missouri to, I don't know, maybe Southern Iowa and over into Virginia and West Virginia and cuts right sort of through the middle of Ohio where tall fescue is the preeminent um, for, forage species, you know, grass species. Uh, the thing is, part of why it's such a powerful organism is it has a symbiotic relationship with a fungus 
it's called an endophyte because it grows like through and between the cells of the plant above and below ground. Um, and it, it sort of pumps it full of energy. Uh, you picture mycelium mostly being underground. This is a, an endophyte is something that has mycel mycelium also running through the living tissues of the plant. It's a great endophyte, but normally it produces uh, toxic alkaloids. And if you don't feed an animal anything but normal tall fescue, uh, it, the, the alkaloid is a vasoconstrictor. And so especially if you let any of the um, fescue go to seed, uh, you can get all kinds of kind of unfortunate um, side effects for your livestock. Like cows will get... Um, their tails will have such poor circulation that they'll get like gangrene. So um, this often happens when people are not managing their uh, pasture very closely uh, because in a management intensive grazing scenario, um, because of the end of fight, the tall fescue can just be eaten into the ground and bounce back under the climatic conditions that we have here in the fescue belt. But uh, it, lots of other species do okay and coexist pretty well with tall fescue if you're moving the animals uh, on a good schedule. Anyway, um, there's also a couple species of clover, white clover, red clover in there. We, as you'll see later in the plan, we uh, had them plant a few other things. Um, but yeah, they, uh, they, they raise small grains, corn. Um, sorghum sedan grass, they bale it and they feed it over the winter in their like in their milk barn. So uh, during the winter, the animals are basically just hanging out by the milking barn and uh, uh, eating hay that they produce on site. Um, there's two ways to do silvo pasture. There's sort of, and the the politically correct one is silvo pasture through addition of trees into an existing pasture. Um, a less well understood practice, though I, I would argue that it can be done in an ecological way, uh, is doing silver pasture by removal, where you thin an overstocked stand of trees and uh, sow forage in the understory. That is not something that the um, NRCS supports. So if you are getting money from the NRCS, you pretty much need to. Um, be planting trees in your pasture. If anybody has particular interest in how to thin trees and establish pasture, that's sort of a sidebar that we can get into. Is that part of anybody's curiosity or should I just skip that for now? Okay, well, we'll just skip that for now. There's, there's very, there was very little uh, wooded acreage on their farm and so it was sort of a moot point, but for a lot of people, it's not a moot point, which is why I raised it. Um, they were open to uh, bringing in chickens, um, but they weren't too interested in it. They kind of had their hands full of the cows. Their neighbor keeps bees, uh, which uh, forage quite a bit on the clover throughout the pastures, including this one that we're converting to silver pasture. Um, and uh, so the pastures that they had selected to plant trees in were the ones that were grazed during the summer. And there's some shade at the edge of the field as there often is from like fence line trees, uh, which is an interesting pattern, you know, because you can potentially create a silver pasture by just fence, like uh, having a couple of hot wires a few feet apart in lines down your pasture and uh, eventually trees will grow up in that area, but we're trying to be very intentional and get very high performance, you know, the right tree in the right place for the right job. Um, so the, these people had like a complex set of goals that they want to accomplish through establishing silver pasture. I don't blame them. Um, the first type of thing that they wanted to do is get shade really quickly, which means planting very fast growing trees. In this case, um, we talked about a few different options and they settled on uh, hybrid willows. These are willows that people um, uh, have bred for like woody biomass. 
uh, to like burn in a retrofitted coal boiler for heat or electricity. But they actually grow really tall and really fast and really straight, assuming you have enough soil moisture to support them. And so a third of the trees are these quick shade trees, which are hybrid willow. The second um, type of tree that we put in there were black locust. And unfortunately, black locust is another whole can of worms politically. Um, oh, I see there's some, something in the chat. Just a moment. Never saw honeybees work red clover when I had hives. Any other beekeepers in here saw otherwise? Well, I'm mostly talking about the white clover. So good point. But um, yeah, white clover. Uh, and as we'll get to, we prescribe when they're doing a little pasture renovation and seeding other stuff. Um, uh, they're putting in um, forage chicory and uh, lotus corniculatus. What's that called? Bird's foot trefoil. Um, which, and that, you know, depending on where you are, that's not a good choice. It could become invasive. It's not particularly invasive in pastures in um, southern Ohio. Anyway, the second. Uh, type of tree that we planted were black locusts. Uh, they grow very quickly. Uh, they they uh, provide good shade. Uh, and when we say good shade, we're talking about dappled shade, where um, if you have a, so much shade that you're shading out your grass, obviously you're kind of shooting yourself in the foot. And, you know, honey locusts and black locusts, we're planting black locusts here, uh, have compound leaves. So each leaf has a bunch of little leaflets coming off the side and subsequently little gaps. So there's light dappled light getting down. Um, the third type of tree is sort of like the standard, the longer lived um, tree that's going to provide the long term shade after those shorter lived species uh, get cut down or die out. And for this, uh, you have a few different choices because they had the goal of having supplemental forage, uh, two of the best choices. And again, people might dispute this, but uh, are the thornless honey locusts. There's uh, a handful of cultivars that um, have been bred to have these big juicy pods that are just, they taste like bananas if you crack into them and eat them. Um, you get like 200, uh, oh no, excuse me, 2,000 pounds uh, per acre per year additional forage uh, from these honey locusts once they get mature. And they have about the nutritional profile of cereal oats. Um, so, uh, and they put a few, a few pecans in there. Um, it's sort of the northern, very northern edge of the pecans. Um, and they, there's already some old pecans growing around there. So we threw a few grafted or improved uh, seedling pecans in there in place of some of the honey locusts. I think they also are putting in a few grafted American persimmons. And American persimmons don't are not like a super fast growing tree, but it's the same as the honey locusts. Um, the cows love eating the fruit. and um, just provides additional forage. So they were grazing about 280 days a year and then moving the animals into the barn or around the barn. And so we're trying to just put it on an extra 20 days of um, foraging in this pasture where they don't have to grow as much forage in their other fields. And, you know, that's sort of the, the rationale behind that. Um, Okay, hopefully you all think this is really interesting. Um, I think it's super interesting. Uh, would you mind, and I'm, I'm going to wait until somebody answers this question for me, uh, telling me how many acres uh, of pasture you have uh, for your summer pasture? Because um, I just want to do a little experiment here and uh, do a little math on screen. Because I want to calculate how many trees per acre you might end up putting in a field and if nobody answers joey just make something up and i'll work with that got it got it
All right, Joey, how many acres of pasture do you have on your farm? Oh, I've only got 23. Okay. Well, uh, the math for figuring out how many trees per acre uh, based on the spacing that you want is really not that complicated. It's like middle school or high school math. You take the square feet in an acre, which last time I checked is 43,560. And then you divide that by the product of your in-row spacing. You know, you're planting a row of trees. So is it 10 feet or is it 20 feet between those trees? And then your alley spacing, which could be 40 feet, like in my chestnut orchards, uh, or it could be 60 feet or 100 feet, you know? So let's say, um, let's say uh, Joey in this example um, is going to have fewer trees with the wider alley. So it's a uh, hundred feet. Um, and this is because he's worried that there's gonna be a drop in forage production if it gets too shady, or maybe Joey decided he wants to grow some chestnuts and they don't have compound leaves. So there is not, um, uh, yeah, so you need to have them wider spaced or else they'll shade out your forage. Well, um, but you also want to have a side business of uh, growing chestnuts. And so uh, you, you feel like you might be wasting some space if you plant them farther than 40 feet apart. Are you all seeing my um, the math I'm attempting to do here in the in the Word document? No, we're still seeing the uh, Buckskin Valley plan. Okay. Well, trees per acre is going to equal square feet in an acre, 43,560, uh, multiplied by uh, the product of 40 times 100. And I'm just going to put that in my Google bar here for a minute. Um, that is, uh, you know, between 10 and 11 trees per acre. Uh, that is not enough to provide the shade that's going to get the benefit for the maximum benefit for the livestock. Um, you want at least 20 trees an acre usually. And so in this case, I'm going to come back to Joey and I'm going to say, well, what if, what, hear me out, Joey, what if we uh, have just 75 foot alleys instead of hundred foot alleys? So I just rerun the number and that's 14 trees an acre. Okay. Well, that's not what we want. So I'm twisting Joey's arm and I'm going to say in row spacing needs to be 30 feet an acre. The alleys can still be 75 feet. That gets us to 19 trees. We're very nearly there. So I'll say, what if we do it? Um, 60, uh, 60, 65 feet apart, you know, uh, in the alleys. That gets us 22 um, uh, trees an acre. So that's all, that's pretty simple math. I can't see anybody's faces, so I can't see you nodding along. I hope you're nodding along. Um, yeah, so th they said, Badger, we want quick shade. We want to see the um, increase in uh, milk production in the summer within the first five years. You know, we want it. We want more money. So um, what we have initially uh, or what we eventually settled on, let me see here, um, within the budget limitations, because they were working with the grant that gave them X number of dollars per acre, uh, we had 50 foot alleys, uh, which was narrow, you know, they wanted 100 foot alleys, but they also have these other goals. So I, I talked them down and I tried to pack as many trees as I could within the row to get that number up to get the quick shade trees uh, up. And so we had 14 foot within the row, um, which gives us about 63 trees an acre. And as I mentioned before, these are three species that live, you know, different lengths of time. A lot of times a black locust around here is gonna peter out around, you know, 60 years old or something. Uh, lo uh, the black locust, the uh, honey locust can live to be 130 years. 
And then um, as the black locust and the honey locust get tall enough to provide shade, uh, you might want to actually cut down the, the willow and uh, give more room for the longer lived trees. So basically there's going to be two successive thinnings here. One is when you cut down the, the willow um, and you can estimate when you have to do that, but it's basically just when the trees start crowding each other, you go down and cut down the willow. Um, our recommendation was uh, cut them down right at the ground level and then let them re-sprout and let the animals eat the re-sprouts until the root systems of the willow give up the ghost uh, because it's high quality forage. Uh, and the black locust is really high quality forage as well. Um, there are condensed tannins in the leaves of black locust, uh, which bind with the endophyte, uh, with the alkaloid in the rumen of the cattle and uh, make it more digestible um, and prevent them from having the, uh, the, you know, endophyte toxo, you know, toxic syndrome or whatever. So eventually we're, we've cut down the first, you know, the willows, maybe year 15, we've cut the uh, black locusts when they're at the um, diameter that would make a good fence post because they're planning to let them grow until they can get a fence post out, out of each of these black willow or black locust. And by that time, the honey locust will be tall enough that they're, uh, and there's enough, right? There's more than 20. There's, you know, 21 um, honey locusts per acre at that point that have some pretty good size to them. Um, the honey locust all of these trees, but especially the honey locust, is going to provide a little patch of shade that moves around, you know, depending on the angle of the sun. And so the the cows, if it gets, it gets, it gets hot in the middle of the day, they're going to be hiding in the shade underneath a bunch of widely scattered trees, and they're going to be grazing naturally where they're in the shade. So it... it um, it, 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 in a sense, these trees are helping enforce the prescribed grazing protocol that we're suggesting. Um, any questions about any of that uh, before we move on? <laughs> Quiet group, but that's fine. <laughs> um, I have... Um... I mean, I have a bunch of questions if you're ready to open it up to um, broader questions and answers, but I don't want, if you have more to show us from this uh, plan, I don't want to. Oh yeah, we, we have lots more to share. Um, I'm going to go into just a little section on, you know, the ecological basis of this. I think I'm going to zoom in so you can see the pictures a little better. Um, you know, the archetype of the savanna. This is Dahmer Savannah on the left in Ohio and uh, Bennett Springs Savannah in Missouri. You can see there's some, you know, there's more trees in Bennett Springs, but they're smaller. And you can see there's patches of light and a thick layer of grass underneath. And this is a natural community. These are all like prairie grasses and stuff uh, in both of these examples. So this is kind of the, the blueprint for what we're doing. Um, the next couple of pictures are... Uh, people doing this in pecan orchards, which is common in some places in the South. One of the reasons that people are open to doing this at uh, uh, Buckskin Valley is one of them had grazed um, uh, beef cattle under a pecan orchard on what's uh, Jimmy Carter's old farm, you know, in Georgia. Um, so that's, pecans and cattle and grass are, are uh, pretty standard in some parts of the world. I do want to make every time I talk about silver pasture, I have to talk about uh, elk and deer and stuff. On the right here, you see a bunch of elk. Most of these trees are um, black locust. And this is a, a reclaimed strip mine in Kentucky. Um, and there's a few little uh, autumn olive 
Uh, there's a fair amount of Lespedeza cuneata, which is an invasive, but also deworms animals really get really well, again, because of the condensed tannins that they have in them. And so this is, I'm just trying to show pictures of this. This is not just sort of, we didn't come up with this idea. Um, this is something that we're just imitating from nature. So um, yeah, we're going to get out maybe a, we could get into the Gingrich stocking chart. I don't think that's that important because we are not talking about silvopasture by removal of trees. But um, if you talk to a forester, uh, if you live in a state that supports silvopasture by removal, um, you could tell the forester that uh, you want to have the the stocking density of the trees around the C line or even up towards the B line. But um, the more trees you have, basically the less forage you'll have on the ground after a certain point. So you're trying to keep the trees and the forage in very weak competition for the light resource. Um, all right. Uh, so how do you actually do this? I would suggest, and this is based on personal experience as well as research on uh, reclaim mine land and how to get trees to survive better there. And, you know, a lot of pastures, uh, if they haven't been attended to well, are gonna have pretty compacted soil. So if trees don't like, are not able to grow roots very well through compacted clay soils, especially, fortunately, this is like a silt loam, but you can start by subsoiling a line and basically planting the tree in or next to the line of the subsoiler. This is like a two foot, you could even get three foot if you have a really big tractor, um, metal shank that uh, is, is tearing just a very narrow trench through the ground, loosening up the soil. If there's a hard pan, because people used to, you know, use a moldboard plow and grow corn on the land, um, you're breaking that up and, uh, Oftentimes, you know, the trees have access to more air. People don't realize this, but tree roots need air just as much as they need water or anything else. Um, rainwater infiltration is going to be better if you do a rip. Generally, people find that trees uh, grow better if you do this subsoiling first. On mine land, where, it's, where compaction is a huge issue, people will actually do a grid pattern of ripping where they, you know, say you're planting on a 20 by 20 grid. People will, yeah, just subsoil on a 20 by 20 grid. And then where the two lines overlap, that's where they plant the tree so that um, all, all the tree roots don't just grow in the furrow of the very com the soil that's been very compacted, but they can grow in two directions. And that keeps the trees from getting blown down in a windstorm. Uh, hopefully, nobody's soil is that compacted. Um, uh they told us you know our our quiet season is in the fall we have less work to do so we're going to plant in the fall rather than in the spring a lot of people like to plant in the spring but the spring is when the grass is growing and when there's the most milking to do you know they're milking twice a day during the spring usually and so uh they're not they don't want to plant in the spring so planting in the fall um we taught you know, I'm surprised nobody asked about this, but uh, normally a question I get is, uh, aren't the trees just gonna be destroyed when they're young by the cattle um, or any of the animals? You know, a sheep will eat the, the bark and girdle a baby apple tree, for instance, I've seen it before, it's pretty sad. And so we say that each, um, each tree is gonna get a five foot tall tree tube with uh, a fiberglass stake. Um, I like to use weed mats. Sometimes, especially if you have a bull in there, they'll just mess with the weed mats. The weed mat is mostly to keep the grass at the base of the tree um, from uh, competing too much with the roots of the young trees for soil moisture, because there's nothing worse than planting a bunch of expensive trees, uh, not that expensive, but you know, a, a grafted tree, if you grafted it, you've got time in the grafting and you had to find the 
the scion wood, or if you bought the grafted tree, that's going to be expensive. Um, so uh, the alternative is to go throw two or three five gallon buckets of mulch around the base of each tree uh, to suppress the grass. Um, I think that's a really good idea if you have access to mulch. Um, wood mulch works better than hay by a long shot. Um, trust me, please just take my word on that. <laughs> um, yeah, so we've we've ripped, we put a tree tube around everything. We put because they said you know they they thought their bulls were going to rip up the weed mat, you know the plastic weed mat. They're opting for for mulch around the base of the tree. Um, let's see here. Keep going. Um, you know, zoom out just a little bit. So we got. Uh, they they thought that they could get fifteen hundred dollars per acre in uh, cost share, either from the NRCS or from an internal grant that uh, the co-op was offering members to do. Um, uh, sorry, my AmeriCorps just bombarded me with questions there. Um, yeah, so we basically planted as many of many good trees as we could while still hitting that 1,500 an acre uh, target of funds that they had available because, you know, they've got a lot of time in it. Um, um yeah so based on the soil test that we took uh and the agronomist recommendations uh, they want to put down some potassium sulfate i was surprised that they could do that but they said the their organic certifier would let them some gypsum to get the sulfur up and uh some poultry litter which they could get locally very inexpensively uh, to help get their uh, phosphorus level up. Uh, we also, um, in the spring, uh, they put some more, they put some more forage species down. I really like the chicory, uh, the indoor cultivar. And uh, they also put down some more white clover, figured they'd make their beekeeping neighbor happy. Um, and you know i was trying to get them to plant some bird's foot trefoil i don't think they went for it um in terms of greenhouse gases fun fact uh if there's a if they if cows have access to bird's foot trefoil i think the study i wrote uh said that they you know fart out like 40 percent less methane than if they don't have access to it and there's a few sort of anti-flatulence plants that you can feed cows but just in terms of you know very, these people are very worried about climate change and methane is a pretty serious greenhouse gas you know i don't know if any of you uh care about that or want to prioritize about that but that's that's a thing you can do um also all psych clover so just more diversity of forage um and you know some of these trees you want to get on the stick uh six months ahead of time and make sure you have access to the planting stock you need you know the thornless honey locust with giant pods um is not the easiest thing to get a hold of uh, hopefully that'll change um uh the the willow, uh, Miabina willow is a good one. Austria is another one that's very fast growing. There's a willow farm in Ro in uh, Roseville, Ohio, that they could get those from. Uh, Shipmast locust is a sort of freakish uh, New England cultivar uh, or strain of black locust that grows like 100 feet tall. Or People say that they've grown them to be 150 feet tall. I don't know if I'd buy that, but um anyway food forest farm selling seedlings of those or clones of those um i would say uh don't don't buy trees that are less than a foot tall you know get something that 
is obviously showing vigorous growth from the first year of its life. Um, uh, because if you plant a dud, you know, it, it might not catch up. Um, millwood, in terms of honey locusts, millwood is a good one. Hershey is a good one. I don't know. I think there's about four other cultivars that people sometimes use. Uh, bass pecan trees, mostly a pecan um, germplasm orchard. They sell uh, sticks of scion wood for all these fancy honey locusts. And so what I was telling them is buy, you know, buy a honey lo thornless honey locust rootstock from Cold Stream Farm, which is just sort of like a conservation tree nursery. And then they said, yeah, we, we want to do the grafting ourselves. So go order the scion wood from this bass pecan trees. Um, and then let the let the honey locust have a full year in the ground. And then the next year, you know, top work them in the field and put the graft the sticks on there. Um, I don't really feel like talking too much about grafting. There's workshops on them through extension every spring normally. Uh, so if you want to get into that, it's not too hard. Um, you just get a sharp knife or a box cutter or something. I see we have a question in the chat. Uh, uh huh. I'm going to talk about the sheep, chickens, etc. Yes. Okay. So, so this this uh, silver pasture plan was written with forage in mind um, for cattle. If you're raising chickens, uh, the it might not actually be a forage question. It might be I want to plant some trees out in the field um you know my chicken tractors so that the hawks don't get them um and the whatever's growing in the field is less of a consideration there's these people in Miss in minnesota um a guy named reggie he's got a bunch of different projects with different names but basically he plants like elderberries and uh select seedlings of you know eastern filbert blight resistant um hazelnut and you know he's got like 800 of them per acre you know because they're not very big trees they're more like shrubs and it pretty effectively keeps the hawks off of them and uh, then he'll go in and after the chickens ravage the pasture he'll he'll move them and then he'll take a no-till drill and put in what anybody else would call a cover crop um and then you know when the forage is six inches to 18 inches tall it's like wheat and um he's got a mix that he promotes but uh they'll come in and they'll eat the it's basically like sprouted grain out of the ground and uh he claims that he gets a lot more bang for his buck out of the same amount of grain if he uh if it's sprouted and growing out in the pasture so um that's one way um you asked about pigs. It's very traditional if you have a nut orchard to go in and have the pigs eat any nuts that you didn't manage to pick up. Um, you know, you don't want pigs rooting in the ground and uh, tearing up the sod too much. So normally they either have like a ring in their nose or you get one of these um, heritage breeds that doesn't dig very much and eats grass rather than eats the grass roots. Um, goats, as you know, they like to eat, you know, uh, non-lignified woody plant tissues. So normally when people ask about goats, I say, well, goats are actually the one that I would use, uh, most in the, um, silver pasture by removal scenario where you've got, this is very common in Ohio. I don't know how it is in Virginia, but a lot of times people will have a few acres of woods in the middle of their pasture. The understory is just totally eaten up in honeysuckle or autumn olive and certainly multi-floor rows. And uh, the goats will do a number on all of those things. And then you can come in and brush hog after them. And once the invasives have grown up, you can hit them again with the goats. And if you want to, just like we've suggested with the um, black locust 
and the willow, you could actually manage those root systems of the invasive shrubs as a source of forage. And so instead of just annihilating them, you treat them like any other forage. But, you know, that's, I feel like that's, uh, you're not supposed to say that because those are invasive. But if you're a certified organic, you either, you can't spray them. So you either overgraze them until they're dead or you work with them in the ecosystem. And I, I don't have too much to say about that, except that it's good to not let invasives go to seed and become somebody else's problem on the next farm over. Um, uh, yeah, Joey, why don't you ask a follow-up question if you have any, uh, like a, a follow-up question for that uh, line of inquiry. Um, yeah, I mean, I think um, one of the things that um, you've you've done, a, this plan is pretty much introducing trees into um, a dairy orchard or into a dairy farm to um, have... Um, better milk production, better shade, and better forage for the cows. Um, yep. I, it, um, if you are um, introducing, if you're doing something different, right? If, you're, if your main goal is not like getting better um, life for the cattle, but maybe your main goal, goal is growing three crops, growing um, apples, chestnuts, oh, yeah. whatever. Um, what, what are the uses for animals in those sorts of systems? Sure. Yeah. So if you're growing nuts or fruit, um, uh, if it's for human consumption, a lot of time you need to move the animals off. I think according to the food safety people, like 120 days before you are picking up any nuts or fruit off the ground. If you are growing the, um, the nuts or the uh, fruit, for the animals primarily, then you can just have them on the whole season that they're dropping the crop. And in this case, that's sort of what they're hoping is that the honey locust pods and a few persimmons are going to um, add an extra 20 days of, of forage uh, on there at the end. So their primary goal was the shade and increased milk production. And we, we estimated on that 24 uh, acres that on an average year, they'd have a little more than $9,000 more milk um, because of the shade. Uh, but uh, that that increased dollar figure did not account for the costs of uh, forage, you know, the w winter forage that they didn't have to feed um, because that was pretty complex. There was, they were growing like five different kinds of forage. And so uh, that was, they would have had to pay me more to try and crunch those numbers. Um, but they're, yeah, they, that was a pretty high goal for them too. And why not, you know, uh, besides just the, the nuts and fruit, you know, grazing on the honey locust resprouts, or excuse me, the black locust resprouts um, is, is, is very good for the cattle. So. Uh, okay um well we are we are right up at um eight o'clock i want to give another minute or two for any more questions and answers um from the audience uh the not anonymous attendee do you feel like you got your um question answered i'd take that wait a minute i see a smiley face that's a good yeah. sign mm. Yeah. Great. Cool. Um yeah, and um you know, if you as as always is the case with these webinars, if you guys have questions um that don't pop up until a week or two later, never hesitate to reach out um to um to us at future generations and um and if I if I need to bo bother badger i will um yeah yeah please and, do yeah <laughs> and uh, you should have our emails um and i will um give another minute or two for any more questions and then i'm gonna launch the poll so there'll be a, a brief poll 
that you need to answer um, as you as you exit. And you know, thanks for coming out. I'll 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 go on one more tangent, and that is if you are thinking of thinning uh, a natural forest stand, um, and you're and you're trying to get funding from somebody, I would suggest uh, planting native warm season grasses and forbs, um, just like you see in the savanna pictures here, um, because uh, you will probably not upset the foresters who work for the state that you live in as much. Um, you know, I mentioned that the, this farm is hoping to transpire more moisture out of the ground, um, because some of the, some of the fields sit a little bit wet. Um, the trees are going to draw a bunch of moisture and, uh, push it out of the bottom of their leaves, to the stomata. If you, so that means that you're trying, and this is a summer paddock, right? They're, this is where they put them during the summer, and so they want more shade. If you grow native warm season grasses in this savanna level stocking system, uh, they're going to put a lot more biomass on during the summer than tall fescue will on an ordinary year. If it's a really wet year, the tall fescue will probably just keep growing. But if it's not, uh, the, the big blue stem, the Indian grass, uh, the eastern gamma grass, uh, or in the switchgrass, they all that's when they shine is like in July, you know, uh, late June, July, August. And so there's a slump in forage production from the tall fescue. There's a, this peak, this huge peak. And so you can get more forage by grazing native species uh, during the summer. I'm not saying that you should put more than 20% of your ground in native species, but if you put native species under the trees, a forester uh, if a forester has to sign off on your silver pasture plan because you're getting funding through the NRCS, they might go for that because uh, they don't like tall fescue because um, it stunts the growth of trees as well as can be too much of a good thing for the cattle. All right, I'm going to get off the native species soapbox, but I think it's an important one. It's a good one to be in. All right, um, I'm going to go ahead um, and launch the poll and. Um, like I said, never hesitate to reach out to us in the future. And thank you so much, Badger, for agreeing to uh, speak here tonight. Um, I certainly learned a lot. I'm pretty sure everybody else did, too. Russ gave us a big smiley face. Well, good. It's good to be with you all. And uh, uh, if you have any follow-up questions, please don't hesitate to reach out. Uh, badger at ruralaction.org is my current email address. And i um, always happy to chat about this stuff. It says host and panelists cannot vote, so I'm not going to pad the results here. No, thank you. <laughs> <laughs>